Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Elizabeth Wetlaufer? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing you in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, consider supporting me on Patreon, and check out my podcast, Bella Grande Media. I will put the relevant links in the description for this video. So first I'll go through the background of this case, including the criminality, then I'll offer my analysis. Elizabeth Wetlaufer was born in Woodstock, Ontario, Canada, on June 10, 1967. She grew up in a close family. Her parents were Baptist and quite strict about it, especially her father. Elizabeth was described by people who knew her as enthusiastic, energetic, bizarre, awkward, and shy. Elizabeth started to wonder if she was gay. She struggled with her sexual identity. Eventually, she considered herself to be a lesbian, but she started to view her own identity as morally wrong, probably because of the values of her family. She would later claim to her friends that she found God and was not a lesbian anymore. At one point, she was sent to conversion therapy, which was intended to transform her to heterosexual. This type of therapy is banned in many locations now, including Ontario, but at that time it was allowed there. When she was in school, she found herself in trouble a few times. On one occasion, she pulled a fire alarm in order to get a boy she was arguing with in trouble. After secondary school, Elizabeth attended London Baptist Bible College, where she would earn a bachelor's degree in religious education counseling. During college, her substance use became pronounced and highly problematic. It started to dominate her life. She was not shy about her drug use. She made little attempt to hide it from anyone. After earning her bachelor's degree, she went to Conestoga College and studied nursing. By 1995, she was a registered nurse. She worked at various long-term care facilities. Due to her substance use and behavioral problems, she generated a substantial number of complaints, was suspended a few times, and was fired by one employer. She complained about the termination, and it was changed to a resignation, which meant getting a job in the future would be easier. In 1996, she found a job in a group home for people with disabilities, not as a nurse, but as a support worker. In 1997, she married a truck driver named Daniel Wetlaufer. By 2006, Elizabeth was contacting women online and forming romantic relationships. She started hearing voices. To combat the voices, she would sing Bible verses, like she was trying to block out the auditory hallucinations. She was becoming angry with herself, and she was angry at God. It was at this time she started fantasizing about murdering people. She believed this would be a way for her to channel her anger. Her fantasies became more frequent, intense, and dangerous. She tried to compartmentalize her fantasy life. She would fantasize about homicide and then try to have relatively normal thoughts, essentially trying to divide her thought processes in two parts. So she would engage in the fantasy life, but she believed she really could keep it away from actions, like it wouldn't translate into actual murder. After getting suspended for mistreating patients, she checked into a mental health treatment facility. She was diagnosed with major depressive disorder and borderline personality disorder. Elizabeth's marriage would end in 2007, after her husband discovered one of her online relationships with a woman named Sheila Andrews. Elizabeth and Andrews became a couple. Andrews would say that Elizabeth had temper tantrums and generally acted like a child. In 2007, Elizabeth went to work as a nurse at a long-term care facility in Woodstock, Ontario. She did not fit in well with the other nurses. She kept showing up to work under the influence of alcohol and other substances. On one occasion, while working the night shift, she was found unconscious in the basement she was in that state due to intoxication. From June 2007 to December of 2007, Elizabeth injected some of her patients with insulin. Two of these patients would later die, but their deaths were not due to the insulin injections. From August 2007 to March of 2014, Elizabeth continued injecting patients with insulin. Many of the injections occurred in narrow time windows, like there were several in 2011. Two of her victims would survive, a 63-year-old and a 57-year-old. 
seven of her patients would die. The victims ranged in age from 79 to 96. The facility, of course, was not aware of the murders and attempted murders, but they did notice that Elizabeth had a number of medication-related errors. They suspended her on four different occasions. She was fired in March of 2014 after having an incident the facility considered serious. She gave the wrong medication to a patient, which resulted in the patient experiencing a great deal of pain. Elizabeth went to work for another long-term care facility in London, Ontario, where she murdered a 75-year-old patient. They let her go after she was voluntarily admitted into a substance use treatment facility. She found another job where she was rotating through seven different facilities. She attempted to kill two more patients. She resigned after this. On September 16, 2016, Elizabeth was admitted into a substance use treatment program at a mental hospital in Toronto. She confessed to the staff about her murders and attempted murders. They contacted the authorities. Elizabeth emailed the College of Nurses of Ontario, which is a regulatory body for nurses, and told them that she had deliberately harmed patients and was being investigated by the police. Therefore, she was electing to resign as a registered nurse. After confessing to the police the next month, October, she was charged with eight murders. In January of 2017, she was also charged with four counts of attempted murder and two counts of aggravated assault. On June 1, 2017, Elizabeth pleaded guilty to all charges. She said that she understood the difference between right and wrong, but she was attacked by what she referred to as red surges, which were beyond her control. She said God or the devil or whatever wanted me to do it. Technically, that should have been whoever, but either way. After one homicide, she heard her own laughter, which was like a cackling from the pit of hell. After killing, she felt horrible. It never gave her any pleasure. Elizabeth said that she had told her pastor, a romantic partner, and a few friends about her crimes, but no one believed her. On June 26, she would be given eight life sentences to be served concurrently with the possibility of parole after 25 years. She is technically eligible for release in 2041, although it is highly unlikely she will ever be let out of prison. Now moving to my analysis. During the time that Elizabeth was murdering people, she developed an interesting attitude toward her victims, which was based on their gender. She pictured male victims as aggressive and exhibiting inappropriate behavior. She felt as though they needed to be punished. She viewed female victims as miserable pets. From her perspective, killing them was an act of mercy. It was in their best interest. What about the mental health factors with Elizabeth? As I mentioned, before her arrest, she was diagnosed with depression and borderline personality disorder, BPD. Elizabeth was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, ASPD, after her arrest. ASPD is characterized by repeated criminality, impulsivity, irresponsibility, deceitfulness, aggressiveness, a reckless disregard for safety, and a lack of remorse. All of these seem to be fairly consistent with Elizabeth's behavior. BPD is characterized by frantic efforts to avoid abandonment, an unstable relationship pattern, identity disturbance, impulsivity in two areas that can be self-damaging, having a desire to bring an end to one's life, affective instability, chronic feelings of emptiness, anger, and paranoia. What really stands out in terms of the homicidal risk is the psychosis, the fantasies of homicide, the inability to resist temptation, and her access to lethal drugs and potential victims whose deaths were not surprising, like the fatalities weren't really investigated at all. As far as her personality, Elizabeth appeared to be high in openness to experience. She had a lot of fantasies, low in conscientiousness. She didn't worry at all about trying to behave in accordance with the rules of society, like she was reckless and really exhibited no cautious behavior. She was above average in extroversion. She was described as friendly and outgoing. We see below average agreeableness. She certainly was not altruistic and high neuroticism. She was depressed, anxious, angry, and could not resist temptation. How was Elizabeth Wetlofer able to get away with her crimes for so long? Here are a few of the reasons. 
Number one, she wasn't fired when she should have been fired. In Ontario, addiction is considered a disability. It's difficult to fire someone who has substance use issues. The care facility did not want to get involved in a lawsuit. Also, the facility may have been short on staff. This was especially true for the night shift. Number two is the method of the homicide that she selected. It's hard to detect insulin during an autopsy. It's extremely difficult to distinguish between natural and artificial insulin. Number three is her choice of victim. Many of her victims were advanced in age, medically compromised, or both. When a resident of a long-term care facility who is 85 or 90 years old dies, it's not usually a surprise, and it does not cause suspicion. Number four, nurses are usually not homicidal. It's an occupation that is not synonymous with murder. That's why we don't see phrases like nurse mystery party, premeditated nurse, or nurse conviction. Now, considering these reasons, it seems as though Elizabeth never should have been caught, but actually, she should have been caught many times. There were a number of warning signs. Other than the 130 complaints filed against her during her career and myriad disciplinary actions, there were other indicators. I will talk about a few of them here. Other than her confession to the staff at one facility and to the police, Elizabeth confessed many other times. She confessed to her attorney, who told her not to say anything. He, of course, would not be allowed to tell anybody, especially because she was telling him after the murders were completed and did not express an intention to commit more. She told a girlfriend that she had killed two people with insulin overdoses. The girlfriend told her, don't do that anymore. You don't want to get caught. I find it interesting that the first thing the girlfriend thinks of is how Elizabeth should escape responsibility rather than having any type of empathy or concern for the victims or future victims. Elizabeth confessed to a teenage volunteer at one of the facilities, going into detail about her homicides. The teenage girl stopped being friends with Elizabeth, but never told anybody about the murders. Elizabeth confessed to her pastor about how she murdered a 90-year-old woman. He took her hands and prayed with her, saying, This is grace, this is forgiveness, but if you do it again, we'll have to report you. Elizabeth admitted to an ex-boyfriend that she had killed several people. He said, why don't you stop being a nurse? Why don't you change your job so that you don't have the opportunity? He never reported the murders. In addition to the confessions, there were other clues, although it's not clear how many people would have seen these or how obvious they are. A few examples. Elizabeth wrote poetry. Here are a few lines from one of her poems. Quote, she watches the life drain from the notch in his neck vein. As it soothingly pulls, it smothers her pain." Unquote. If anyone had read that, they should have been somewhat concerned. On one occasion, a co-worker of Elizabeth noticed her leaning over someone who was close to death. In a creepy, childlike, high-pitched voice, Elizabeth said, quote, If you want to let go, it's okay. Your family will understand. Your time is here. See the light." Unquote. One could argue that her words may not be that out of the ordinary under the circumstances, but the high-pitched voice is what concerned many. Elizabeth used to repeatedly sexually harass employees and volunteers at the facilities, for example, making inappropriate jokes, asking women out on dates even after they said no, and asking teenage volunteers to come to her house. At one Halloween, Elizabeth dressed up as the Grim Reaper. The people at the facility, of course, did not realize that this wasn't really a costume. The costume was when she was dressed like a nurse. After confessing, but before being arrested, Elizabeth moved back in with her parents. Neighbors said that she was laughing hysterically when talking about what she was facing in terms of the crimes. Elizabeth thought the whole situation was quite entertaining. Moving to my final thoughts in this case, this is a case of an unlikely killer who made every effort to be caught. She gave pretty much everybody around her all the warning signs they could have ever desired. She confessed to who appeared to be the most morally ambiguous group of people one could imagine. It's pretty sad that the advice that Elizabeth received from them could just have easily matched her saying something like, I want to sell my car, but every time I turn the air conditioning on, it makes a horrible noise. Yeah, that doesn't sound good. You better stop doing that. The people she confessed to couldn't even talk themselves out of it 
like they couldn't say, well, it's not like you killed anybody. I think it just goes to show how pronounced their lack of empathy was for the elderly. If nothing else, Elizabeth's out-of-control substance use should have prevented her from working as a nurse in an effort to be compassionate to people who suffer from substance use problems. The safety of the residents in these facilities was disregarded. Regulating licensed professionals is a challenging balance. Professionals who suffer from mental illness or behavior problems should be given chances to restore their competency, but certain clues, like confessing to multiple murders, should not be ignored. They need to be taken seriously every time they appear. Those are my thoughts on the case of Elizabeth Wetlofer. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.